So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Karis, and I'm one of the youth leaders. I'm the youth pastor in the evolution. <laughs> and uh, one thing interesting about me is that I love cats. I love cats. Yeah, so my Instagram, my TikTok are all flooded with cat content. And not just that, but my friends flood me with cat contents too. So, well, that's me. You ready to go? So, the title of my message is called Ground Zero. So, sometime last year, I was in Japan with my mom, and it was crazy, okay? Because what we did was we packed the schedule, and we covered more than eight cities and towns in under 11 days. And not just that, but we happened to see Typhoon Hagovis also, all in the same trip. How crazy, right? And one of the places we visited was this place called Hiroshima, the A-bomb dome, where the first atomic bomb was dropped. So it was estimated that it killed more than 70,000 people instantly, and intense fires burned down everything in a radius of two kilometers from ground zero. The city was literally reduced to dust and ruins. So what ground zero is, is it is the point on the Earth's surface that's closest to a detonation. So basically, it marks the point of the most severe damage or the most severe destruction and violence. So it's also the point where you are building from the very beginning. Got it? And sometimes life you know, can feel that way too, right? Life can feel at ground zero. I mean, recently, Stephen Curry made a comment, and he said that he felt like the Golden State Warriors are starting at ground zero again. Because after having a five-year NBA final streak, the Warriors had the worst record in the Western Conference this last season. So, well, maybe your life feels that way too, given how 2020 went, that your life feels like it is at ground zero. Maybe for some of you, you feel like your life's really falling apart. Maybe this year has been particularly very difficult for you on so many levels. You personally really feel like giving up. Maybe COVID has directly or indirectly affected you and your family. Or something painful has happened this year and you're just really down and you're really out and you're really just not okay. And I'm so sorry if this is happening to you or to your family. Or some of you, maybe you feel parts of your life is falling apart. Parts of your life is in a mess. It could be that you are struggling with something for the upteen times. Like, I know, not again, you know? And you can't seem to find a way to get yourself back up. It could be a struggle with confidence over and over again. It could be a struggle with fear, it could be a struggle with anxiety, with pain, with loss. Or it could be you're caught in a whirlwind of bad decisions after bad decisions after bad decisions, and you just can't seem to redeem yourself. For some of you, it could be you are genuinely just disappointed. Maybe you have been working so hard at something, for a very long time, not just this year, but for a long time, and you feel like you are back at square one, like back at ground zero, working at it all over again. And I know it can feel extremely exhausting when you feel that all that hard work and all that toil seemingly did not help you progress one bit in life. Or maybe for the rest of you, you're going through some sort of crisis personally like quarter-life crisis. <laughs> I think most of you are 25 and under, so maybe you struggle with fifth-life crisis. <laughs> you know, like a one-fifth, like 20 at 20, or a sixth-life crisis. Okay, I don't know. You have no idea what you're doing or where you're heading to. You're just feeling a little lost in life. If that is you, I want you to know then that this message is for all of us here who may be or will be at ground zero of our lives. So, and the honest question is, what do we do at ground zero? You know, what, what should we do? What's good to do? With that, I want to tell you three things that's really helpful to do 
And I hope it will speak to you as much as it's speaking to me. Shall we go? So number one is when you're at ground zero or you feel like your life is at ground zero, the first thing you got to do is you got to let go. <laughs> you got to let go. In every disaster and destruction, the first step to restoration and rebuilding is to clear away the rubble, to clear away the mess one piece at a time. And this can be the most tiring or tiresome process. So I want us to look into a story in the Bible about this person called Samuel. Okay, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1. So I want to say, hi, Samuel. We have Samuel here. <laughs> so what's happening here is Samuel was a prophet of God. He was, in other words, the spiritual leader of the people. But despite having a leader, the people still asked and demanded for God to give them a king because they want to be like other nations. And so God commanded Samuel to anoint this guy called Saul to be the king. So now, King Saul, okay, rather he's not king yet, but Saul is a really good-looking and tall young person. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Hey, <laughs> okay, all of us want to be good looking and cool and young, right? Okay, so, okay, so all's good. I mean, he's good. But all's good up to the point when King Saul disobeyed God on two major accounts. And he overstepped his authority and he showed that he had no regard for what God says on two major things that happened. So when Samuel heard about it, Samuel was furious and he was upset and he was disappointed. And when Saul, when King Saul was confronted, he justifies and he denies and he came up with a lot of reasons. And since then, Samuel never seen King Saul again. And the sad thing is that King Saul never looked for Samuel again. So at this point, you can imagine that Samuel was deeply saddened and disappointed about Saul, the king whom he had mentored all these years. This was probably coupled with Samuel's disappointment in his own sons as well. Because if you don't know, just chapters before this, Samuel actually wanted his sons to lead the people. But it turned out that his sons were greedy, dishonest, and corrupted individuals. So I can imagine how Samuel feels. Like all the people whom he had believed in and mentored just did not love God, just did not love the people. All they cared about was themselves. And he felt like everything he had done came up, to, came up to nothing. And he is back at ground zero. And we finally come to this point in the Bible where God says something. In 1 Samuel 16, 1, which is the verse you want to get to, which is, the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul. I have rejected him as a king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I found my next king among his sons. So, well, the first thing God said to him was, how long are you going to grieve? So before you think grieving is not okay, no, that was not what God meant. At this point of time, it was years and some even estimated that it was probably up to 10 years after what had happened to King Saul. But Samuel hasn't let go of him. So I believe that we need time and space to deal with dis disappointments and discouragement. But sometimes, just because we have time or we have space, it doesn't mean that we have let go or cleared the rubble like we should. 10 years can go by in Samuel's case, and we may still be well at the same place. And just like what God says to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve? It's time to let go. I feel that God is saying to some of us too that it's time to let go of some things. So for some of you, I don't know, for some of you, maybe this may mean that there are people in your life, there are incidents in your life, there are things in your life that you've got to let go. 
And sometimes letting go is yes, moving on. You got to leave it and move on. While other times, letting go doesn't always mean to cut off. Sometimes letting go means to let be, which is letting things come and go on their own. Or maybe for some of you, there are expectations, there are dreams that you need to let go to. You've been holding on for a very long time, it's not happening for you. And as a result, you're just really disappointed. And maybe, maybe it's time to let go. Or for some of you, there are t- pain or painful experiences, hurt or disappointments that you need to learn to let go to. So when I say let go, I want to make a distinction here that letting go doesn't mean to give up. Okay, it doesn't mean to give up. It doesn't mean to throw everything out of the window and just, I don't care about anything anymore. <laughs> okay? Because one thing you've got to do when you are at ground zero is to recognize what's important and what's not. Let go of what's not important, but hold on to what's important. Ironic, I know, because I'm telling you to let go, right? But I'm also telling you to hold on. But it's so important because when you feel like you are very down and very discouraged and you hit rock bottom, you, may, you need to realize that some things are not important, while some things are really important. So in 2011, a 9.0 earthquake hit Japan, and a tsunami of at least 10 meters high swept across the coastal cities. And along with that, it took an estimated 18,000 over lives. Wow. I remember Pastor took a team of us, and we volunteered to help with the relief work of clearing and the restoration of some of the damaged houses in Sendai that year. How awesome, right? And we heard many stories, including the families who have helped, how they have escaped and how they survived. But there are also other anecdotal accounts like many people hesitated when the warning sounded and they went back to their homes to take their money and their jewelry, but sadly never made it out. Some residents actually successfully evacuated but returned thinking that they had time to retrieve some family heirlooms, photo albums, valuables. Uh, There was even this story of a man who went home to protect his valuable tea he had at home. Of course, in retrospect, when we look at it, we know lives are way more important than material things, right? But when you are down and you are out, and especially when you are anxious, Sometimes, you get all confused and mixed up and messed up. The things that you need to hold on, you don't hold on. The things that you need to let go, you don't let go, right? Is what I'm saying. So I say again, when you feel like you have hit rock bottom, you've got to realize some things, some values, some relationships really, really matter, while some other things really don't matter. And you should also realize that what you thought was important may not really matter at all. So you've, at this point, I just want to encourage you, hold on to God. Don't run from God when problems hit. Just because life is at a standstill doesn't mean that you should throw everything out of the window and run. You got to hold on to important relationships that have always been there for you and brought out the best in you. Because you never know, these decisions, these relationships will end up saving you. I love what Bob Goff once said, this guy once said. He says that if it matters more what your faith looks like than what it is, it's time to start all over again. So I know it's pretty deep. I'll let it sit with you a bit. He says, if it matters more what your faith looks like than what it is, then it's time to start all over again. And what I'm saying is that Ground Zero forces you to have to focus on what's important not what it looks like, but what it is. And it may not be a bad thing to start all over again because it gives you an opportunity to do the important rather than the impressive, to live for what matters rather than just the superficial, to have real significance, joy, faith, rather than just a fleeting hype or a fleeting success. And with that, I want you to know that I hope 
we all figure what's important and what really matters in life. So that's the first thing we got to do. The second thing is, I see some of you are still like furiously typing. <laughs> you got it? Okay. Second thing is, you got to be a stranger. When you're at ground zero, you got to be a stranger. So what do I mean? Do you know that they find that there are two things that give people new perspectives in life? So very quickly, I want you to just in your heart, write it down. What do you think are the two things that gives people new experiences, new perspectives in life? Two things that change people, genuinely change people. Got it? The first is wonderment. The first is a genuine amazement and awe. When you look at something and you go, wow, like genuinely like, wow, they say that that changed a person. So I guess it's better to be someone who is easily inspired, right? Rather than easily skeptical, right? Because in, in any way, you will be changed as a person. So that's the first thing. The second way um, that people change is easy to guess. It is suffering. <laughs> suffering and a certain kind of awe, like wow, amaze, leads you to new experiences in life. So in other words, they have the power to change you as a person. Everything else is just a confirmation of what you already know, of what you already experienced. So I know that difficulties and storms sound terrible, they are terrible, okay? That's why they're called difficulties and storms. So they are horrible. But they force you to see things in a new way. They change you. Do you know that there's this gigantic, this is a random fact, a gigantic boat that was stuck at the Niagara Falls for more than 100 years. It had not budged one bit, even with the torrential waters like beating against it for well over a century. And guess what happened? It was a severe, severe windstorm sometime last year in November that finally caused it to move, like a little bit. I mean, it caused it to like spin and then turn around and then spin like a little bit. But you know, in the same way, sometimes we need to go through some storms and difficulties to change. Because the sad fact is that we can be as stubborn as the boat at the falls, right? So when, when the storm of life hits you or your life seems to be falling apart or you are feeling like you're falling apart, when what used to work don't work like how you used to before, it's probably a good thing to say, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I don't even know myself anymore. I know it sounds a little emo, but maybe it's a good start where you go, I don't know, there's something new out there that I got to find out. Because at Ground Zero, we've got to be a stranger. We have to embrace the fact that things are not the same, that we will not be the same too, and that's okay. So I want to encourage all of you here that the end of yourself can be the start of something new. The end of yourself can be the start of something beautiful. So storms, difficulties, failures, mistakes are not the end of your story, but they can point you to something better. They can make you better. Right? So this is another story. There's this another tree. There's this tree, not another. This tree called the Socrates Exorizer. Okay. <laughs> it's like really a mouthful. It sounds like a philosopher name, by the way. Socrates Exorizer. Okay. In other words, this tree is called the walking palm tree. Pretty cool. So this palm tree, when faced with soil erosion, right, it will try its best to seek new ground. So sometimes, going as far as 20 meters from its original position in order to establish new roots to survive and to thrive. 20 meters is quite, quite something. So over the couple of years, this walking palm tree will gradually adapt to the direction of the new roots and thereby relocating from its original position. So in the same way, I believe that your storms, your difficulties, your disappointments, your discouragement can lead you to new places and new grounds and even a new you. So with that, I want to encourage you, let whatever that happened in 2020 lead you to a better you. 
let your ground zero be a new ground. Or rather, it is a new ground. It's not too bad to be a stranger in a new place, is what I'm saying. So let's look back into Samuel's story. Still remember him, right? So back to the same verse in 1 Samuel 16. The second thing that God said to him was, fill your horn with oil and get going. That's the second thing, sentence. So in other words, God's saying to him, fill your flask with some new oil and get going. He wants Samuel to set out on a new journey to find the next king. So the interesting thing was when Samuel arrived at Jesse's place, right, this place that God wants him to go, his eyes immediately fell on Jesse's eldest son. So Jesse has a few sons. So his eyes fell on one of the sons, and this guy called Eliab. So guess what was it that attracted Samuel's attention? Eliab was really good looking. <laughs> And he was tall. So do you remember who else was also good looking and also tall and young? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. King Saul. So and at this point, God taught Samuel something new. God says in 16 verse 7, have no regard for his appearance or stature because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans only see what is visible to the eyes but the Lord sees into the heart. So it does take some effort to change, okay? Not to fall back on what's familiar and to fall back on our old patterns and to fall back on what's comfortable. It certainly took Samuel a little while to realize like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> now I see the resemblance, okay? So I want to encourage you, don't let what's familiar and what's comfortable stop you from having something better. That's why I say be a stranger, right? Because I believe God wants you to have better. So I want to encourage all the young people, embrace new beginnings, embrace change, embrace the new thing that God is speaking to you, become a stranger, and let difficulties and storms point you to something better, and most importantly, a better you. So that's the second thing. Third thing, you ready? So yay, finally we are at our last point. So what do we do when we are at ground zero? We go at it again. We go at it again. In other words, we build, we rebuild. So just like what God told Samuel in the last part of the sentence, the last part where he says, I'm sending you. God is also saying to us that I am sending you to go again. So what I want to encourage you is even when life is messy, even if you feel like you're struggling with something over and over again, like you're just at ground level struggling with the same thing, even if you feel like you're starting all over again, that you are never starting from scratch. So though you may be at ground zero, but you never start at zero, is what I'm saying. Every experience, every challenge becomes material for you to go again, as long as you're willing to go again. And the important thing to know is that you are never alone. So back to the Hiroshima story. So the aftermath of the Hiroshima bombing was horrible. It was marked with chaos. There was a lot of confusion going on. And one of the things is, there are many things that happened. One of the things is the city mayor, which is the leader, was among the victims, was among the dead. So the city lost their leader. And thousands of public servants, teachers, health professionals were among the victims. So the government office actually employed 1,000 people, but the following day of the bomb, only 80 people reported for work. Everyone else um, died in the, in, in the disaster. So 14 of the 16 major hospitals no longer existed. But what's impressive was those who survived pulled the city together along with large volunteers from the neighboring towns and the neighboring cities. So they are not alone. Everyone else surrounding them came to help them. And what's impressive was the lights came on in the affected area just one day later. Wow, I don't know, is it because they're Japanese or, you know? <laughs> water pumps were repaired and started working like the water supply in just four days after an atomic bomb. Power was restored to all the households in just four months. So young people, I want to say this, that go again. Give your best again. The thing is, you got to live your life like 
today is your last day so that you can give it all you've got, right? You don't want life to just pass you by passively. You want to live the life. But also, at the same time, you forgot to hope like there will always be another day. Like there will always be another chance to go again. That is never too late to try again. Now, I really believe that the best thing a life can do, that our life can do, is good. As much as life is fraught with difficulties and adversities and a lot of injustice, we know, but this is where you can do the most good. And there is so much goodness, I believe, God wants to show you and wants to impute to you here. So young people, you know, don't give up on doing good. That you, to know that you can always go at something again, that you can always imagine again, can always dream again, trust again, bloom again, believe again, love again. And I always say this to God to meet us here again. Do you know, after the atomic bomb, um, there's a rumor that went round that nothing would grow on the land for the next 75 years. But just after a month, bright red kana flowers sprouted in the rubble. So in the same way, if anything, I hope that you never give up on you because God's never given up on you and you are never alone. So do you know that Jesus' death on the cross, right? Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when he did that, it seemed like the end of his life. I mean, it is the end of his life on earth. It is the end of his ministry. It seemed like everything he has built and done in three years came crashing down at ground zero the moment he took his last breath on the cross. So Jesus is without sin, without blame, but he willingly went to the cross to die. I mean, there were people who taunted at Jesus and tell him, say, why don't you save yourself? You know, I, I've done all this in three years. Why don't you just save yourself and prove that you are God, right? But his death marks the beginning of new life. A new life that Jesus freely gives to all of us. He took our sins, he took our mistakes to redeem us, to give us an opportunity to have a new life to come closer to God, to come closer to His goodness. So what I want to say is that Jesus' ground, Jesus's ground zero was just the beginning. Beginning of people changing, people experiencing more goodness of God, coming to connection with God, to experience the love of God. And in the same way, I believe God is saying to you that your ground zero, wherever you are at, wherever you are, that it is the beginning of something better, something new.